We are at the top of the hour, so we will go ahead and get started. Um, I, I'll tell you, I just love these events. It just makes my day to see all your smiling faces and I am I am really excited about today's training event, and I just can't wait to dive into it. Today, we have the honor of hosting Brad Wilcox, and he's going to speak on the marriage paradox and why marriage matters more than ever for kids and adults, even if it's less common. And as always, I want to let you know that there will be a Q&A session, so you will have the opportunity after the presentation to ask any questions that you might have for Brad. So we'll save those for the end of his presentation. And I also do want to let you know that we are recording this entire session and we'll be putting it up on our YouTube channel. So you're going to have the opportunity to go back and review any part of today's session that you would like to. And we will also share Brad's slide deck with you. So you'll also have that to go back over. And, you know, um, in talking with Carl, I can just really tell you, he really does believe in Brad's new book. And he believes that Brad's new book is really the most important marriage book to be released in many years. And it's not because there aren't plenty of marriage books out there, but it's because this book, Brad's book, communicates why marriage is important and why it matters. And as we all know, our job as CMI leaders, it's threefold. We talk about this all the time. It's to inspire, to resource, and to empower our communities. And in that first part, to inspire, our job is really to elevate the importance and the value of marriage, to really reframe the way we think what, what and what it is we believe about marriage. And so Brad's book, it's the most current and the most highly researched resource tool for us to strengthen our case in this. And so, you know, this is something we talk about all the time too. Healthy marriages create strong families and strong families create strong communities. And Brad's book it affirms that our work in doing that is important. So as community leaders, we want to get the word out that marriage is important. And what better time for us to do that than National Marriage Week and also at the release of Brad's new book. So the purpose of our time here together today is really for you to get to know Brad even better, for you to hear the latest from his research and for you to get a perspective on the content of his book and to, to really just prepare ourselves for our February 2024 opportunity. National Marriage Week is February 7th through the 14th, and our theme is Love Beyond Words, and we're really excited about it. And so before we begin today, we always like to begin with prayer, and today we have Salome Scaff with Austin Marriage Initiative from Austin, Texas, and he's going to be leading us in prayer. So Saul, whenever you are ready, sir. Thanks, Stephanie. All right. Good to be here with you guys. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, we love you. Thank you that you are equally present with each one of us, wherever in the world or country we are, and not just now, but always, and uh, not just in our work life, but in our home life in our marriages, with our kids, if we have them. Um, and you are working out your purpose in each one of us. And we just recognize that it's so often through marriage that you help refine us and uh, draw us closer to you as we realize our own shortcomings and, and growth areas. And so we thank you that you're gracious. Thank you that you brought us together. Thank you that you're working all things together for the good and to help build your kingdom. And so I just pray that this time would be useful for that. Uh, pray bless each one here and just give us ears to hear what you want us to hear out of Brad's presentation. Uh, Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much for your first all. That was great. All right. Well, I am thrilled to get to introduce you to our speaker for today's training event. 
Brad Wilcox. And Brad, he's not your run-of-the-mill sociologist. With a career spanning the University of Virginia, the Institute for Family Studies, and the American Enterprise Institute, Professor Wilcox is your go-to expert on all things related to marriage and family life. Hailing from the University of Virginia, where he was a Jefferson Scholar, he went on to earn his PhD in sociology at Princeton University. He's done some serious research time at Princeton and Yale. And Brad, he's not just an academic powerhouse. He's also an author and co-editor of five books, including the upcoming HarperCollins release, Get Married, Why Americans Must Defy the Elites, Forge Strong Families, and Save Civilization. His insights on marriage, cohabitation, parenting, and fatherhood have been published in prestigious journals like the American Sociological Review and the Journal of Marriage and Family. And if that wasn't enough, if you're not already impressed with his bio, his research is reg regularly featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and NPR, among others. So today, we are in for a great treat as Brad shares his knowledge and practical wisdom with us. So without further ado, Brad, we are all ears. Well, uh, thanks, Stephanie, for that gracious introduction. It's good to be with all of you this afternoon. So I'm going to begin appropriately enough, I think, for this group uh, by referencing a myth that my wife uh, <laughs> mentioned to me, Danielle. Um, and it's the story of King Midas. I think, you know, everyone has the sense that King Midas had a good life. Um, he was working hard to protect his kingdom. He was respected by his subjects. He loved his daughter. But all this wasn't kind of enough for King Midas. He wanted to be kind of like at the apex of the monarchies in Asia Minor. So, you know, one day he got a shot at his ambition when Dionysus offered him one wish, you know, and he said in response to that request, I want everything I touch to turn to gold, you know, said King Midas. And Dionysus said, are you sure, Midas? This could end badly. But he answered in the affirmative. So Midas got his wish. He walked about his kingdom, turning everything he could into gold. And at first he was gleeful, thinking of all the riches and glory that would come his way. He was daydreaming about that <clears throat> ambitious agenda to take his kingdom in the 21st century. And the New York Times profile and multi-million follower account on Instagram that would follow. When Midas returned to his castle, he was in for some surprises. He tried to have a meal, but everything he ate turned to gold. And this got him worried. And meanwhile, unbeknownst to him, his daughter came up behind him to give him a kiss. And before he could warn her, she kissed him and was also turned into gold. At this point, Midas realized he'd made a grave mistake. His beloved had been turned into a rock. Despair filled his heart. The power that he had sought with such a singular focus, Midas realized, was not a blessing, um, but a curse. Okay, next, next slide, please. So I offer this story as a way to kind of think about how many elite voices in our national conversation are, are advancing a kind of Midas mindset, this kind of mentality that life is about education, it's about your work, it's about money. Um, it's not about marriage and family. Next slide, please. And this kind of perspective has been articulated in any number of kind of more elite, kind of journalistic, largely left-leaning platforms in recent years. This article from Bloomberg kind of gives you a flavor of this kind of perspective. It says that women who stay single and don't have kids are getting richer. OK, and next slide, please. And in the article, what we hear is not only that there's kind of this supposed association between avoiding marriage and avoiding kids and riches for women, but there's also kind of this message in the article that the pathway towards fulfillment, towards happiness, runs away from family, not towards family. And they offer a, a woman named Ashley as kind of the example of this idea in this Bloomberg article. And there are many other you know, essays and articles you could find in the New York Times and the Atlantic and other platforms that kind of give you this basically anti-nuptial and even anti-natal message uh, today. 
But what's interesting is that we're kind of getting this message, not just from the left today, but also from what I call the red pill right. Next slide, please. And so if you don't know kind of Andrew right. Tate, the guy on the right, he's someone you should unfortunately get to know. He's a big uh, online influencer on the manosphere. A lot of teenage guys, a lot of young men know about him, follow him and kind of take into account his advice. And he is strongly opposed uh, to marriage, um, as is the woman actually, you know, on our left, Pearl Davis, who is also kind of a, an online influencer in the manosphere. And their argument basically is that marriage is a bad deal for men uh, because of higher risks of divorce. So they encourage men to focus on making a lot of money on basically using women, but not relating to them in any kind of authentic or profound way and kind of going their own way. This is kind of the, the newer message emerging from the online right. So it's these different kinds of elites, both on the left and on the right, who are kind of telling us from their perspective that marriage is a dead end and that we should instead cultivate a kind of Midas mindset, if you will. And so how this cashes out among my students at UVA, for instance, is there's this kind of this idea you know, that they should be focusing on their career and money and success rather than focusing on love and relationships, not to mention marriage. And Holly here is an example of this kind of thinking that I encounter among a lot of college students at the University of Virginia. Next slide. So we see this too kind of in the general public now, unfortunately, where more and more Americans, including especially younger adults, are saying that education, work, and money are more important for them um, and for their sense of fulfillment or happiness than marriage would be or, or having kids oftentimes as well. And this you know, slide from uh, Pew gives you a sense of this kind of, again, this Midas mindset that's sort of, I think, percolating in the general adult population at large and including especially younger adults as well. Uh, next slide, please. And so it kind of raises the question for us is, you know, what does the data tell us about kind of the relative value of things like education, work and money versus marriage and family? Next slide. And it's true that education, work and money matter for people's sense of happiness for their meaning and direction in life. Next slide, please. But <clears throat> marriage outpaces education, work, and money um, in the data. Next slide. And what we see is that nothing compares actually to a good marriage when it comes to ordinary women and men's uh, sense of happiness. Next slide, please. So what you can see here is that college, money, job satisfaction are all kind of powerfully related to being happy with your life, um, but being married surpasses it all, and that's the blue bar. And then there's a green bar, maybe behind your, your panel, but it's much, much higher um, than the other <clears throat> bars in this particular figure. Next slide, please. And so what we see in our research is the odds of being very happy with your life increased by 545%. <clears throat> for Americans who are in a good marriage. And this is by far and away the biggest predictor in our models of global life satisfaction for American men and women. So again, more important than education, work, money, religious attendance, self-rated health, sexual frequency, um, being in a good marriage just blows every other factor out of the water. And I also just want to thank Carl here um, because I mean this, these were kind of in our our findings and in our models, you know. And you know, I sort of had mentioned this in the book, but when this <clears throat> was mentioned by Carl in the previous presentation to your group, his eyes just kind of bugged out, and he really kind of encouraged me to underline this finding for the general public and for people working in the marriage space as well. Next slide, please. So this is, I think, because, you know, these kinds of findings are because we know that man is by nature a social animal and that we derive more meaning and purpose and happiness from family and friendships than we do from things that might get us money or status or divert us in some way. Um, and so, again, a lot of, I think, American adults don't appreciate this fundamental social reality. They, they think that 
more fun time, more free time, a better job or the things that are really going to bring them happiness. Um, and I think too, there's a class story here as well. I think better educated folks are focused more on work oftentimes, less educated folks are often focused more on having, you know, fun time, free time, you know, maybe <clears throat> other kinds of things. But what neither of those groups are appreciating again is that our friendships and especially our family relationships are what tend to give our lives the most um, meaning, direction, and happiness. Next slide. And so <clears throat> from my perspective, our contemporary Midas curse then today is that many of our biggest problems in America, from falling rates of happiness to cratering fertility rates, the stagnant character of the American dream economically, arise from the fact that too few Americans are prioritizing or are able to successfully marry and have a family. Next slide, please. And we've seen, for instance, that since 1970, um, the marriage rate's fallen by about 65%. So again, in the last 53 years, essentially, we've seen marriage come down by 65%. And well, what does that mean practically, you know, for young adults today? Next slide. Well, it means basically that there are more and more folks out there like Scott. Um, we're predicting that about one in three young adults today, um, again, one in three young adults today will never get married. And we've kind of never been in demographic territory like this. So what does that mean? Because kind of from the Midas mindset, you would think someone like Scott would be, you know, a pretty happy guy. He's got a graduate degree. He's got a good job working as a military contractor. He makes more than $100,000 a year. He owns his own home. But for Scott, this is not enough, okay? He says, quote, you know, I've got degrees on my wall. I've got accomplishments and certificates, but it doesn't mean anything in the end, he told me. It's not like I can take any of that with me after I die. He feels alone and at sea on many a day. Quote, I have to get up every day and look in the mirror and realize I'm alone. I have nobody. And he worries about the kind of fate that might await him should he fall sick later in life. He's in his mid-30s right now. He says, quote, I have no help, you know. If something happened to me tomorrow, there'd be no one for me. So it's in this context that he's struggling with a toxic mix of loneliness meaninglessness and sadness. So I want to obviously acknowledge that there are plenty of single adults in America in their 30s, their 20s, and well beyond that who are flourishing. But we do know from the research that I'll touch on just briefly in a second, that single Americans, unmarried Americans, are less likely to be flourishing, and they're more likely to be experiencing challenges of one sort or another. So this is why I think we need to be worried about sort of the retreat for marriage that we've seen play out since the 1970s. Next slide, please. So we can see is that, for instance, reports of unhappiness are climbing fastest among those who are unmarried in what's called the General Social Survey, the GSS, as this slide here kind of indicates. Next slide, please. We're also seeing evidence that marriage matters more than ever when it comes to adults' financial well-being, kind of the household economic story, um, is getting stronger and stronger for marriage. That is sort of the gap between the marrieds and the unmarrieds is growing um, since the 1970s when I was born to the present, as this figure here indicates. And also, it's just as a side note, Bloomberg is totally wrong. Married women are in much better shape financially than unmarried women. Next slide, please. And then for our kids, we're seeing not just that marriage matters for our kids. I think everyone on this call kind of knows that research to some extent, but my new research indicates that marriage matters more than ever for our kids. So when it comes to college graduation, when it comes to school suspensions, when it comes to families' financial well-being, what the research is telling us is that the marriage benefit for kids is bigger today than it was 16 years ago or 40 years ago, depending upon you know the study and, and the and the topic. So again, there's more and more evidence that for men, women, and kids, it's not just that marriage matters, it's that it matters more than ever, again, emotionally, financially, and for the sake of our children. Next slide, please. So that's kind of the bad news. You know, given the fact that we're seeing kind of marriage trends come down, um, and given sort of the benefits of marriage, we can kind of think about all the ways in which 
the retreat from marriage in our society is leading to a lot of negative outcomes for adults and kids and communities across the U.S. But I don't want to kind of end our our conversation this afternoon on <clears throat> on a bad note. So what's the good news here? Well, the good news is, next slide, please, that a large minority of American adults are forging what I call strong and stable marriages that are happy and divorce free. Next slide, please. And those four groups that kind of make up this, you know, generally speaking, um, you know, group of folks who are forging these uh, marriages, what I call family first marriages, are Asian Americans. Uh, they are the faithful, that is Americans who attend religious services regularly. And they're the strivers, that's college educated Americans who've kind of got a more long term orientation and the capacity to delay gratification as well. Um, you also want to notice that I put in conservatives, and I wasn't like really actually intent on doing this when I wrote the book, but as I just kind of crunched the numbers, I found more and more evidence that conservative Americans, above and beyond religious Americans, um, were more likely to hold attitudes that were marriage friendly today, and also more likely to report happy marriages. So I've included conservatives as kind of the fourth group in this collection. Next slide, please. And so what these four groups kind of have in common to an important extent are what I call the five C's that kind of are the ingredients of their, um, their better marriages. Next slide, please. And what we see for these five C's is um, what I call communion, what I call kind of a proper orientation to recognizing how important the marriage is for their children, that's the second C. Commitment, that's the third C. A regular stream of cash, that's the fourth C. And community, that's the fifth C. Now, in the interest of time, I'll just talk about the middle as well, sort of communion, commitment, and community today. And you can feel free to ask them about the other two in our Q&A. Next slide, please. And I also kind of mentioned in the subtitle of the book that Americans should defy the elites. And as that kind of subtitle kind of came out into the public sphere, there were a number of folks kind of questioning me. They're saying, well, elites tend to be more likely to get married and stay married. Why are you saying defy the elites? And the point I would make in response to that question is elites are often doing the right thing, but often sort of saying and advocating for the wrong thing when it comes to marriage and family life and love and relationships. So that's why I subtitled the book Defy the Elites, because again, a lot of the messages coming from our elites are what I call kind of a more of a me first approach to life that's not conducive to building a strong and stable marriage. So in terms of these three themes of communion, let's let's think about the elite message on this score number. <clears throat> Next slide. So too often today, I'd say elites are stressing, again, a kind of me first mentality that privileges autonomy and freedom and self-interest in relationships and marriage uh, more particularly. Next slide, please. So let's just take one example here, money. When it comes to sort of how you organize money, we're often getting the message from people like Carolyn Kitchener in the Atlantic that younger couples today should have separate bank accounts. That's a way they kind of can do their own thing, kind of preserve their own autonomy in their marriage, and that this is going to lead to better marital outcomes. And there are many prominent kind of financial advisors, too, who you can find online who are making kind of similar claims today. So it's you know, many elites are kind of getting behind this sort of me first approach to money. Next slide, please. But as I was interviewing ordinary couples across the U.S. and crunching the numbers, I got kind of a very different portrait of sort of how this all plays out in the real world. So if we consider, for instance, the, the story of John and Maria Erickson, what I found with this more conservative couple was that when they got engaged and were serving the 82nd Airborne, they had a very different approach to money developing than was sort of advised by something like the Atlantic. So as they were preparing, again, they were <clears throat> engaged to deploy to Iraq. Maria and John headed off to different stores to get items for their deployment. Maria ended up with the more expensive list, which included items like ballistic glasses. She said they were really expensive, something like $160. 
And so when she brought these items back to John, she made it clear to him that she expected to be paid back for the purchase. But John, her fiance, just kissed her on the forehead and said, quote, what is yours is mine and mine is yours. And now we're going to be married and it's all equal. So John had a kind of a we first approach to, to money and marriage. And both John and Maria kind of quickly got on board with this approach. Um, and Maria benefited pretty quickly from this because after they got married, John brought no debt into their marriage, but Maria brought a lot of debt related to her graduate education into their marriage and kind of together they pooled their money and paid off her debt. Um, and more generally though, they kind of have benefited from a virtuous cycle of communication, trust and mutual dependency both in the financial arena and just more generally in their marriage that served them well for more than 20 years of married life uh, up to our current moment. Next slide, please. So they are not an outlier. Um, what we see in the research is that couples who pool income are happier and less prone to divorce, as this slide here indicates from my YouGov survey for the book. Next slide, please. And then just more generally, what we see both in, in my research in the book and other research by Scott Stanley as well is that couples who take a we before me approach to marriage on a number of different fronts um, are more likely to experience a sense of unity, teamwork, and mutual service that is conducive to marital flourishing. I would also note just as a side uh, note that in my section on community, I talk about the value of date nights and find that having regular date nights is sort of one expression of that sense of communion is one of the most powerful predictors of marital quality um, in my, my research. Next slide. Okay, so what about commitment? How does commitment today figure in today's marriages? Next slide, please. And again, I think that the tragic reality is that too often today, we're getting a, a lot of elite messaging discounting the importance of marital permanence and even now of sexual fidelity in marriage or, or monogamy in marriage, if you will. Next slide, please. This came through in a recent New York Times advice column from Philip Gallinais, who's asked by an older mom, you know, how she should handle her daughter's request or adult daughter's request to bring um, her daughter's boyfriend on their trip to Greece because he was in a polyamorous relationship, both with her daughter and some other woman. And, and the, the older mom didn't feel particularly comfortable with this whole reality. And of course, Galanay's approach to this is that, you know, this mom should kind of just deal with it, respect her daughter's decision, you know, be open-minded, you know, try to, you know, read up on polyamory. So again, he's kind of signaling to her on this big elite platform that fidelity and that monogamy are not very important in his estimation. Next slide, please. But again, as I've talked to ordinary couples, I have found that folks who are really committed to fidelity and to monogamy are much more likely to be flourishing in their marriages. Uh, one guy that I spoke to, a man I'll call Patrick Riley, he's not conservative, he's not religious. He is a, what I call a striver, you know, someone who's college educated, a big professional. Um, and he has a couple of things that might make him kind of at risk for infidelity. He travels a lot. He's a handsome guy. He plays for a band on the side. Um, you know, these are all things that kind of could put him into some kind of trouble. But he was very clear with me in articulating a number of ways in which he kind of makes it clear that he's a family man. Um, he says that he's out and about professionally. He's always talking about his wife and kids. He also mentioned to me that online he's posting things, you know, with his sort of wife in, in the picture on Facebook, and then he doesn't follow any of his old, you know, old girlfriends online as well. So these are kind of all ways in which both kind of in the real world and the virtual world, Patrick is sort of honoring this classic ethic of forswearing all others. Next slide, please. And we see here that uh, women and men who embrace the more classic view regarding fidelity in yellow are more likely to be happy in their marriages than folks who don't. And unfortunately, we're seeing more and more Americans not embrace this idea that it's always wrong to um, have a marriage, I mean, sorry, a relationship outside of marriage. And there's also, a, unfortunately, also now a growing ideological gap where conservatives are more likely to embrace this classic view compared to 
uh, progressives, and the same thing is true for religious versus more secular Americans. Next slide, please. And in fact, we see in the broader research on marital qualities that the number one predictor of marital quality is commitment. And in this big survey that I talk about um, and study that I talk about in the book, that's specifically measured as the sense that your partner, your spouse, is committed to your relationship. But again, the broader point here is that, you know, we kind of need to understand and appreciate how much commitment provides a context for trust and investment and these things in turn lead to flourishing in our contemporary marriages. Next slide, please. The final C is about community. Next slide, please. And, you know, oftentimes I think the elite view is that uh, tradition, including traditional expressions of religious faith, is sort of one way of thinking about community, is an obstacle, actually, to living our best life and to realizing our best love. Next slide, please. There was a big spread in The New Yorker, for instance, not too long ago, that painted Christian men and Christian couples as sort of hopelessly benighted and out of touch when it came to how they handled pornography and their marriages. And there was a lot of problems in the Christian world related to men using pornography and to how kind of their wives were responding to all that. So basically just sort of painting a very negative portrait of the link between faith and family life for more religious Americans. And so of course the question is how accurately did this New Yorker story kind of convey the reality on the ground for ordinary um, religious Americans. Next slide, please. As I talked to ordinary couples across the US, my sense was that <laughs> the New Yorker didn't do a very good job here. Um, now, certainly there are folks who struggle with pornography and that can be a source of tension in their marriage. But I found in general, religious couples are more likely to be doing well um, on the marriage front in general and the sex front in particular. So Martin Kimberly's story, for instance, was that um, and they're African-American Christians in the, in the D.C. metro area, is that, you know, Martin, as this kind of slide says, you know, is pretty careful online um, about kind of what sites he, he, he kind of follows, what he looks at online, et cetera, um, because he says, quote, you know, the Bible is very clear about fleeing temptation, quote, so yeah, certain sites I won't go on. Okay, so that's kind of Martin's way of sort of handling the internet as, you know, as a man. And then for his wife, Kimberly, um, she talked about how when they first got married, physical intimacy was difficult with Martin because she'd been abused as a child. And so that, you know, made, you know, their physical intimacy, um, you know, challenging, as she says here in this quote. But by praying with some members of her church, by praying, you know, to God, she was able to experience a sense of healing that has enabled her to have a good sexual relationship with Martin and, um, you know, one that's uh, been fruitful in a number of ways. They've got three kids um, and, and they're doing quite well in their marriage uh, today. Next slide, please. And we see that this kind of pattern is, you know, obviously kind of pretty common in the, in the broader country at large. Our YouGov survey indicates that couples who attend church together, um, like Kimberly and Martin, are more likely to be happy in their marriages. Next slide, please. We see from work done by Tyler Vanderweel at Harvard that women, for instance, who attend church regularly are about 45% less likely to get divorced than their fellow women who are not. My own research indicates it for both women and men who are attending regularly, it's about 30% less likely to get divorced in a different sample. So a number of us are kind of showing that there's a, a strong link between regular church going and greater marital stability. Next slide, please. Um, and then when it comes to sex, um, there's just no question that Americans who look at sex through a sacred lens um, are more likely to have more sex, actually. I'll show that in the book and to have better sex. Um, and I think this is about a lot of things, but it's probably about a sense that like, this is something that's, that's beautiful and powerful, something that's divinely ordained, but also about the ways in which they have, I think, a greater sense of commitment and trust in their marriage. And those things are um, 
contra the pop culture, quite conducive to experiencing better sex life for both men and for women as well. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> what I'm suggesting to you all this afternoon is that the kind of family first values, virtues, and social networks that are often supplied by religious communities end up typically strengthening and stabilizing marriage in America today. Contra the message we often get, I think, both in the media and also oftentimes in the pop culture or even on social media as well. Next slide, please. So to kind of conclude, I just want to say again that I think we need to be thinking about creative ways to um, discount the Midas mindset because of its materialism, because of, of its careerism, because of its individualism, and to instead cultivate a marriage mindset um, in the general public and in our communities. So we need to be thinking about ways to kind of get the value of this marriage mindset and marriage more uh, particularly to kids in high schools, um, kids in colleges. Uh, we need to also think about new and creative ways to get this kind of message out on social media, given that young adults spend a lot of time on platforms like uh, YouTube Shorts and Instagram today. And we need to think about ways to kind of get this constructive and positive message articulated more often in our churches and in our communities more generally. And I think we all probably know that many of our churches, for instance, unfortunately, even though they're kind of basically pro-marriage, they're not really doing a lot to kind of publicly articulate the value and power of marriage to their congregations, nor are they kind of doing a lot to kind of give their congregants kind of concrete and valuable advice that would help them to navigate the challenges of married life, um, you know, sitting out there uh, in the pews. So this is why the work that you all are doing is so important and why I'm so grateful for your work as we all try to kind of build a culture that is more uh, marriage friendly, that kind of recognizes that life is not about gold, but about, uh, but about love, especially um, about marital love. And again, as uh, we were hearing from Stephanie, you guys can get access to many of these arguments um, and a lot more in my new book, which is gonna be coming out on February 13th in the midst of National Marriage Week. So I'm happy to take any questions you might have um, about the book or other topics related to marriage and family. All right. I do wanna start off with a question that I think everyone is wondering. And that is, Brad, we have this incredible group of community marriage leaders that all have extensive national connections. And then we have your outstanding book, which is packed with detailed research and empowering information. And it aligns perfectly with our work as marriage champions. And what we want to know, Brad, is how can we as CMI leaders best promote your book and get your message out? Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. I guess what I would say is, you know, insofar as you can kind of can give it to, you know, pastors, priests, um, lay leaders in, in family and marriage ministries in your communities, that would be certainly one thing that would be helpful. I think trying to think about, um, you know, the sort of the top uh, radio shows in your communities and how either you personally could kind of advocate for the book or maybe work with you know our team at IFS to get me on some of those shows um, in you know the week around National Marriage Week both that week itself and the week after would be great um, I think thinking about taking you know especially the the sort of the money figure uh, that Carl really kind of identified that is the way in which a good marriage completely trumps everything else, you know, um, in our data visually and kind of just taking that figure and plastering it across your own, you know, platforms online and then social media as well. Just sort of, you know, I think there are so few young adults today who really understand and appreciate how much marriage per se matters, you know, for their future financially, you know, socially, but especially when it comes to sort of their sense of happiness um, and communicating that, <clears throat> that finding to a broad audience with, um, you know, creative social media ideas would be, I think, also enormously helpful, especially if you have younger adults kind of on your, either directly on your team or that you're kind of working with in some capacity or another. So I think 
those are some ideas that I would have for taking um, the message uh, or the messages from the book and communicating them to a broader uh, public in, in your, I mean, I'm also going to be working with, you know, with your team to try to figure out how I can visit many places this spring and just sort of talk about these kinds of findings to, or, you know, to people in your world and then also to leaders in your communities as well. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that. I know that we're, I speak for all of us when I say that we're eager to promote this book and, and um, to get the word out. I see Tom Pritchard from the Twin Cities has his hand raised. So Tom, whenever you're ready. Yes. Uh, thanks, Brad. Uh, great presentation. Um, a couple things, two questions. One is, and you kind of alluded to it, but it seems like society or the elites or whoever uh, are really not only, not just kind of ignoring marriage or live and let live, but there's an actual hostility attack on the institution. And is that, I mean, is that almost kind of a Marxian uh, mindset or ideology that's at play or what's, why do you think that is? And then the second question is, as increasingly people don't get married, they don't have kids, what will life look like when the, those pe people reach retirement age, elderly? I mean, is that going to be a pandemic of loneliness even worse than we have now? Those would be my two questions. Yeah, Tom, those are really at the heart of you know this conversation right now. So thank you for those two. Um, so what animates the kind of what I would sort of articulate now is anti-nuptial and anti-natal currents out there, particularly among many of our elites. And I think part of the story here is just a kind of profound individualism that you know shapes how elites think about their lives. They tend to have more options, more choices available to them, and they you know would treasure those options and choices. And that makes them, I think, identify with a kind of individualism. They often also enjoy relatively high levels of success when it comes to education, when it comes to career. So kind of just, I think there's a kind of temptation to identify with, you know, a strong orientation towards education, money, and career, um, you know, for those kinds of reasons in part. There's a progressive piece here as well, and that is that there's this assumption that we're kind of always moving in a, in a better direction in the society at large. And that, you know, family and marriage, especially is kind of a more archaic and more traditional institution that we can kind of dispense with as we kind of progress forward. Um, but I think the other obviously big piece here is that people are, are having more difficulty finding mates, getting married and staying married today relative to say 60 years ago. And so that shapes why a lot of people on the left are articulating kind of an anti-marriage agenda, but it also shapes why people on the online right, what I call the red pill right, why they're articulating a very anti-marriage message for men. And so they would argue that, you know, for men, because of their risk of divorce and losing, you know, a lot of money maybe, and also especially losing their kids, that men should just steer clear of marriage and fatherhood. And so that's that's kind of a newer trend that I've been noticing of late. And what I would say there is that to men, and just more generally, is that one of the pieces of good news is that divorce has come down um, since its height at 1980. And it's probably now around 40% of first marriages when in divorce. But beyond that, I would say that couples who are going on regular date nights, couples who attend church together, couples who have stably employed husbands, um, interesting enough, her employment neither way affects, you know, divorce, but his stable employment is a big predictor of a marital stability. Um, and then um, obviously embracing, you know, norms around fidelity and things like that. These are all things that help dramatically reduce, you know, uh, men's risk of divorce uh, today. So there are ways you can kind of can, in a sense, divorce proof your marriage that are articulated in the book as well. Um, so that's also part of the story. What was the second thing you had just asked about, Tom? Uh, yeah, what, what you know, is in, increasingly people don't get married, they don't have kids. What does it look like? What is society yeah. and what are their lives going to look like? Is there going to be a even right. deepening of loneliness and isolation? So, I mean, this is really why we're here. 
in part. I mean, I got into this business 20 years ago, Tom, because I was raised by a single mom. You know, I wanted marriage for kids, you know, all that's all very important. But I'm sort of here today for you in part because the book's really more at adults than it is at sort of parents in a sense, right? And what I'm seeing now at UVA is more and more women coming into my office during office hours, articulating a concern about finding, you know, a spouse down the road. And I'm looking around my social world here in Charlottesville, I'm seeing more and more young adults, you know, just for instance, my daughters are getting braces. And it's striking to me how every dental assistant they're working with, as opposed to the, the, the dentists, who are both men and women, but all the dental assistants do not have a ring on their finger. All the dentists have a ring, right? So there's just obviously a way in which there's just a growing number of people who are worried about their prospects regarding marriage, who are not married, and are going to be heading into midlife and later life without a spouse, and often not without children. And what we know is it's going to be extremely hard for a lot of them. And there's really, you know, pretty sobering evidence that I present from Japan, where this process is much more advanced than it is in the U.S., about how a generation kind of living alone and dying alone is pretty bleak. So I look at this book and the work that all of us are doing is kind of like, you know, we're, we're evangelists, smally for marriage, kind of helping people to both get married and stay married in part because we're just much more likely to flourish, you know, when we have a co-pilot in our lives than we are if we're just doing all of this on our own. Thank you for your questions, Tom. I see we have a question from MJ. All right, when I was seeing the statistics you had about marriage, and when I read articles that argue with those statistics, a lot of those articles are saying the statistics are like that for marriage because the people who are getting married are wealthy and well-educated and all those things that there's a... Uh, Association instead of causation. Right. And so how do you address those arguments of people who say that, that it's it's the wealthier class that's getting married and and the poorer class doesn't have access to marriage or has things that are blocking them from marriage? And then I had a second question about that. Yeah. And then how do you address those right. arguments, not just in the statistics, but people who would say that? So, yeah, I mean, I think there are two phrases that you would hear about this. Um, one is correlation does not equal causation. A second is we call selection effects. This is all about selection effects. This isn't about kind of the causal effect of marriage per se as an institution. And certainly the pushback we've gotten from both the left and the right is that the kinds of people today who are getting married and succeeding at marriage are well-educated and affluent Americans. And that's partly true. You know, and so I talk about in the book and I would say to the men, especially both, you know, in in my world and, in, you know, my classrooms and in the book I'm speaking to is like, you know, um, you need to be a lot more intentional about your career and your work, um, because if you're not stably employed, your odds of both getting married and staying married are going to be a lot lower. So that's certainly, you know, part of the story, but I also think that marriage makes men more motivated to, and I talk about this in the book, to kind of be intentional about their work and their capacity to provide successfully for their families. But in terms of addressing the issue more concretely, we have research too from twin studies indicating that, for instance, men who are identical twins, where one gets married and one does not, and to go back to Tom, this is from a Minnesota twin study, the Minnesota twin guys who got married earned 26% more than their fellow twins <clears throat> who were not married. So that's a pretty powerful kind of evidence, if you will, that there's a causal story playing out. There's similar stuff when it comes to things like drinking to excess, looking at twins and how twins who get married um, drink less than their twins who, who don't get married. Um, we, I mean, I think everyone who kind of looks at the the broader evidence on wealth understands and appreciates that when you get married you tend to become more prudent in how you spend money and you're more likely to buy a house and that for most americans their primary asset heading into retirement you know is uh, is a house and for many 401k as well and those assets are more likely to be accumulating when people are stably married whereas folks who are single or folks who are divorced 
are more likely to be moving from one property to the next um, and not being as prudent in how they're spending their money. They're also obviously not being able to pool their money. Um, so it's just kind of a, a way in which mechanically people who are stably married are accumulating a lot more in the way of, of assets over time. And from any given moment in time, generally enjoying more income than their fellow Americans who are not stably married. So there are a couple of things like that that are discussed in the book in more detail. Um, but, you know, there is, I think, pretty rigorous evidence to suggest that this is not just about selection effects. It's also about the way in which marriage is transformative for ordinary adults. Um, and then for our kids, too, um, we again have pretty good twin study evidence that kids, twins, um, what they do is they study often the moms. So one twin gets married and has kids and her identical twin gets married and has kids. One gets divorced, one does not. How do the kids do? And they compare them you know, across both genetic lines and economic lines and then the divorce lines. And they find that even with twin studies that sort of the, the daughters and sons of um, these moms who don't get divorced are doing markedly better than the daughters and sons of the moms who do get divorced. So that's kind of a pretty robust, you know, uh, evidence that there's something about marriage per se that matters uh, for kids. So all I'm saying is that we can, you know, we can begin to look at these. And, and I would also say everyone here can get on Google and there's this thing called scholar.google.com. And you can just type in twin study, marriage, men, or twin study, marriage, women, or twin study, family, children, or family structure, children. And you can kind of get access to a lot of these studies of the, you know, um, on the internet pretty, pretty readily. So um, if you're looking to kind of build out your own arguments on your own platforms, you can do that. I mean, my book has a lot of stuff, but there's also, there are thousands of, um, you know, studies out there that generally correspond to a relatively pro-marriage perspective. We had a question come through the chat and it's from Amy Guilford and she's in Maryland with our Mar Maryland Marriage Initiative. And she said we had a round table yesterday. The topic was a conversation about how to connect negative messages in the teen culture and the impact on their relationships and future marriages. We had a great conversation on strategies to address the challenges but does Brad have practical suggestions on how to impact that cultural narrative? Yeah, Stephanie, I, I mean, I certainly hear about, I mean, I'm, I'm not on TikTok, but I hear a lot of, for instance, negative, you know, shorts and memes on TikTok about marriage and parenthood. Um, and here, I'm, I'm honestly not, I'm not a marketing guy, right? I don't know. Um, what the best strategy, or not a social media guy per se. All I would say is it's important for people to realize that today, men and women aged 18 to 55 who are married with kids are markedly happier than their peers who are not married and don't have kids. The biggest factor usually there is marriage, but even comparing childless marrieds and married parents, I still see that for both men and women, there's also a lot of discourse online about how motherhood's kind of a, you know, a negative thing for women. Um, we're finding that overall, and of course we all know that for parents, extremely stressful at times and hard, blah, 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 but just overall that married parents are doing best. Now it's important too to note that when we break out these numbers by ages, the married moms who are 18 to like 35 are less happy than the married women who don't have kids yet. But from 35 to 55, the married moms have a clear, you know, advantage over the married women who are childless from 35 to 55. So the point I make just here in part is that, again, we're social animals and we derive a lot of meaning, direction and happiness from being in relationship to other people and from giving ourselves to other people. And this is true for both women and men, and folks who do a pretty good job about as spouses and parents, um, as hard as it can be, obviously at times, are more likely to be flourishing and happy. Um, and the research that we talk about in my book is very strong on this. And so if you've got creative ideas about how to best communicate that on TikTok or other platforms, you know, obviously we'd be, you know, grateful to see it. But 
at least kind of let them know that on average, um, the negative ideas are not corresponding to the empirical reality would be, I think, viable. Yeah, that's good. Um, uh, one more question that we had is, are there any key messages or themes from your book that you believe resonate particularly well with our CMI teams and how can we incorporate those into our promotional efforts? I'm not sure exactly, you know, um, I've touched on a number of the, the findings and themes and ideas uh, this afternoon and you probably could tell me better than I about which ones are most resonant for you. I guess, you know, the main thing that I would say is that I, again, I got into this whole business because of kids and my colleague, Melissa Kearney has a new book called The Two-Parent Privilege. She's from Brookings. She's an economist, center left person, a woman, very clear about the value of marriage for kids. Great to have her voice, you know, in the conversation. Um, my book also talks about the importance of marriage for kids. I think the most sobering finding in my book for kids is that Young men today who are coming from non-intact families are more likely to go to prison or jail than they are to graduate from college. Mm -hmm. that, that statistic, just when my colleague Wendy Wang crunched it, just blew my, my mind. You know, That's, I think, the most powerful indicator of how marriage matters for our children today. Um, so that's there. But I think the, the bigger point I'm making is that I'm just trying to get people to realize that the marriage rate's coming down. More and more young adults are not going to get married. And paradoxically, in a world like ours, where there's more economic inequality, there's more social atomization, there are fewer common norms. I think marriage matters more than ever for not just kids, but for adults. So I think that's the, and we know in terms of happiness that having a good marriage is just far and away, you know, as Carl emphasized to me, you know, a while back, the, the biggest thing. So I think kind of trying to get it through people's heads that despite what the sort of more individualistic, atomistic, um, you know, me first, focus on fun or focus on your job, messaging in the, you know, in the culture, we're social animals. And when we invest in our, our wife, our husband, our kids, our friends, um, you know, the long-term dividends there are um, unparalleled. Great. Thank you so much for that. Does anyone else have any questions for Brad today? One last question, Brad. At the end of your subtitle, you talk about save civilization or, you know, um, protecting, yeah, civilization. Are there any books that you've seen where people have actually done studies on the, the civilizational impact of marriage and families? Yeah, so, um, and the point in the book about civilization is when you kind of look at the big picture here, right? When you look at trends in crime, you look at trends in economic mobility, which is just the odds that poor kids rise into affluence as adults um, at the community level. Uh, when you look at um, mass incarceration, uh, when you look at child poverty, um, you know, all these kind of big social issues that often kind of occupy our conversation. What you tend to find in the research, either done by me or by others, is that like the number one or number two or number three predictor of all of that is like the share of married parents or the share of single parent families. So Raj Chetty at Harvard, for instance, finds that the number one factor predicting whether or not poor kids rise across their lives into adulthood and become affluent is the share of two parent families in their communities, okay? And so the reason that the number one metro area in America for mobility for poor kids is Salt Lake City is in part because there are more two-parent families in the Salt Lake City metro area than there are in other, any other major metro in America, right? So that's the sort of civilization point that I make in the book. Now, in general, there are lots of people kind of written about this issue more, um, you know, kind of across time and space. But the most recent sort of book on this is a guy named Joseph Heinrich who's at Harvard, and his book is, um, it's got a, a weird title about weird, I'm gonna look it up here on, online, but um, it's, let me just, Joseph. It's called How the West Became Weird, I think. 
Um, let's see here. No, sorry, it's the weirdest people in the world. Okay. And in that book, he is talking about how Christianity, um, and in particular Roman Catholicism, and he himself is not, I don't think he's a believer of any of any sort, but just sort of the the Christian slash Catholic emphasis on sort of marriage and family led to, um, and also their decision not to allow for cousin marriages had a huge impact on the culture and the economy of the West. Um, and he has a lot of discussion in that book about kind of the specific impact of kind of a, a nuclear marriage focused culture and how that shapes the broader fabric of society. He also has a quote in my book about how much marriage per se is tied to this sort of civilizational fabric for, you know, societies across time and, and um, across the globe. Right. Do we have any last questions for Brad before we close our event today? All right. All right. Well, before we go, I do want to remind you of a couple of things. First, I want to remind you that our CMI virtual roundtable event is going to be held on Monday, November 6th at 10 a.m. Central, and we hope to see you all there. And then I also do want to remind you that National Marriage Week is the week of February 7th through the 14th, and our theme this year is Love Beyond Words. And what we're trying to do is we are creating a pool of shared ideas on National Marriage Week plans in our Slack workspace. So please visit the Slack workspace and post your plans or just brainstorm your ideas for National Marriage Week there so that we can kind of network together and come up with a shared pool of ideas. And that concludes our training event for today. We hope that you enjoyed it. I know that I did. As always, our heart is to partner and collaborate with all of you. So if you have any ideas for future training events or if you need support in any way, please reach out to me at sammy at soltmans.gmail.com. And once again, thank you for joining us and have a great weekend. Thank you all and goodbye.